I said the thermal efficiency of this auto cycle is 45%. Yeah. No, that's a different thing. But no, no, you're, you're, you're going to the second one, which is good. But how do we define thermal efficiency? Isaac. Desired energy over required Yeah, so desired output divided by the energy required to make it happen. So we would, all right, so we have, I think we've been saying thermal efficiency, we've been saying, and that's for a heat engine, for a refrigerator and a heat pump, it's a bit different. Okay, but thermal efficiency has been work net, what you desire, divided by Q net, what you have to put in, actually, sorry, it's not Q net, that would be silly for reasons that may or may not be obvious. Q in, I apologize. Work net divided by Q in. Work net equals Q net for a closed cycle. <clears throat> so that would give you a one. So that's thermal efficiency. Now, oh, I've forgotten your name, it's terrible. But you were alluding to a different type of efficiency and that was called? Oh, it's not counter cycle efficiency, but it's very close. So I'll, I'll pay it because you're thinking along the right lines. So it's second law efficiency. Someone caught it. That'll do. <laughs> Casual. Um, right, so second law efficiency, and you defined it correctly, is then, so we can say second law efficiency, is the thermal efficiency divided by what the thermal efficiency would have been if it was the Carnot cycle. So for the same maximum temperature in the cycle and minimum temperature in the cycle, you can calculate as Carnot efficiency. You can calculate your thermal efficiency after you analyze the cycle and know work net and Q in. Then you can get a second law efficiency, which is how well does your device compare to a Carnot ideal device in the same situation. So those are the two efficiencies we've covered so far. We're talking about a third efficiency now. And I just want to try and make it clear that this is a different thing. So this is isentropic efficiency. So I guess the, the big point is isentropic efficiency is the efficiency of a shaft work machine. So we've been saying uh, a turbine reduces the pressure of a fluid from 10 megapascals to 100 kPa in an isentropic manner. Isentropic here means ideal, perfect, right? What if it's not perfect? What if I said with an efficiency of 92%? What does that mean and what can you do about it? So that's what we're going to talk about um, as our first topic this morning. So this is recap. I prefer doing it as an interactive thing. So we define thermal efficiency. Work out minus Q in. That should probably be work net. The higher the efficiency, the more we get of what we want. So this is our first law for steady state, steady flow systems, right? Heat minus work plus mass flow times enthalpy minus mass flow out times enthalpy equals zero. And if you assume that you've just got one inlet, one outlet, which is not always true, but it's a nice assumption to start with, and work is what you want, this power, because it's um, got the dot above it, so power is what you want. If you said Q was either zero, adiabatic, no heat flow, or negative by some amount. So typically you lose heat from a turbine. Let's think about turbines first. They're a bit simpler. Typically you lose heat from a turbine uh, because the turbine is hot. So the Q term is either going to be zero or slightly negative. Your mass flow is going to be defined by your system. And say you've got a fixed enthalpy in, so let H in be fixed, all right? So how do we define 100% efficiency for the turbine? And it's what we've been doing, which is 100% efficiency would be if it was isentropic. So it's not clear just from this because, you know, we've fixed Q, we've said Q will be zero would be adiabatic, that would be excellent, right? We've fixed M, 
we're saying we're putting a certain fluid into the turbine, all right? And so really you get the most work when H out is as low as it can be. So as, as little energy as you can have in the fluid as it leaves, that means you've got more energy that you use to generate your, in this case it's turbine, maybe you generate electricity. Uh, that would be a normal thing to do with the turbine. Maybe you're running a shaft that's running a compressor in a Brayton cycle, um, back running a shaft through back work. Okay? So you want H out to be as low as possible. But you can't just get a H of zero out of everything. You don't just get liquid water at zero degrees C, which is the arbitrarily defined H equals zero point for us, our steam tables, out of every turbine. H out will have some value and will be based on the, the ideal, the best value of H out will be based on an isentropic process where there's no change in entropy through the turbine. So then, in that case, how do we define efficiency for a turbine compressor pump? Okay, so now we know what the ideal amount of work that we might possibly get out of a turbine will be. Well, we can divide that, um, or we can use that on the bottom of what the work we actually get out of the turbine is. So we can say, how much work did I actually get out of the turbine divided by how much work would I have gotten out of the turbine if it was ideal, and let that be the turbine efficiency. Okay? You'll note that this is just for a single device. So when we talk about thermal efficiency uh, or car, you know, second law efficiency, Typically we're talking about uh, through a cycle. So a cycle is undertaken, what was the work net and what was the Q in through the cycle, okay? So the other two types of efficiency we've been talking about are large system level, cycle level efficiencies. This is a device level efficiency. So this is the efficiency of just that turbine. So if you're asked for the turbine, uh, asked for the efficiency of a, of a single device, turbine compressor pump, it'll be asking for the isentropic efficiency. Or if you're given the efficiency for a device, turbine, this turbine has an efficiency of 92%, it's talking about the isentropic efficiency. So this is the definition in words, okay? The definition in formulas, like as a, as a formula would be, H1 minus H2, and sometimes you'll see this have a little A after it, H2 actual, I think Sendrill and Bowles uses that. Uh, Reisel just uses two. So this is the enthalpy of the incoming fluid minus the enthalpy of the outgoing fluid as it actually existed, divided by the enthalpy of the, in of the incoming fluid minus what the enthalpy would have been if the device was 100% efficient on the bottom. So you'll notice the number on the bottom will always be bigger than the number on the top. There'll be a greater difference in the ideal case than there is in the actual case. Um, so what I've written down here, H2 will be greater than H2S. And so your actual work will always be less than your ideal work. Or your actual power will always be less than your ideal power. And your efficiency is the ratio then of those two numbers. It might be a little bit counterintuitive. That, so an actual process will leave... So say you went between two pressures, 10 megapascal and... 100 kPa, let's just say, a non-ideal turbine, the outgoing fluid will be hotter, same pressure, hotter than in the ideal case. So it won't extract all of the thermal energy out of the, out of the fluid as it goes through. Um, this is then a diagram, so this diagram is from Reisel, so it's saying that you might have a, an ideal turbine that would go from 1 to 2S, but our actual turbine has a process that goes from one to two. And in this case, if it was 2S, it would be a saturated mixture. And if it's two, it'll be a superheated fluid um, because it's kicked off to the right. You notice we're tracking T and S here. So we're gonna move from PV diagrams to TS diagrams, particularly as we go to the Rankine cycle, which we're doing today. Um, they're more useful. Cool, how is everyone with that as a concept? Go. That is the definition. So that, that is the equation that defines it. Okay, is that exactly the same as the definition of words above it? Because wouldn't there be a Q in it? Because it would be just words 
Uh, yes, that's a good question. Sorry, the question is, should there be a queue here? And a queue at the bottom. I think I've assumed the turbine's adiabatic because that would be a normal assumption. Let's think about if it wasn't. If it wasn't adiabatic, then you'd lose heat and that would be colder and it would appear more efficient than it actually is. No. So if it's not an adiabatic turbine, then you'll need to include a Q term. Yes. Yep. So that should. Yep. Work. Is that better? Does that fit better with you? So it's at the actual work that you get out, or power that you get out, divided by the ideal power that you get out. This one. This one must be adiabatic. Well. Because, because it's an ideal process, it must be. But yes, the top line may not be adiabatic. So you might lose some heat. It's pretty normal to assume that turbines are adiabatic or that the heat loss, the ratio of heat loss to power that you're getting out of the unit is so small as you can neglect it. Is not an unusual uh, assumption to make. No, it's a good question. And it, it draws out that I've just simplified without um, justifying the simplification. So thank you, I appreciate that. Good, any other questions, any thoughts? Good, have chocolate. Good question. All right. Keep going. So, what about if it's a compressor? Or a pump? So this is now we're raising the pressure. So what do we have to do? And we find that we actually need to spend more work, we actually need to expend more power compressing a fluid than we would ideally. Actually, sorry, I do like some, another aspect of what you said. Um, what was your name? Annabelle. Annabelle, thank you Annabelle. I do like another aspect of what you said because you said, can it be adiabatic but not isentropic? So yes, absolutely. So if you've got a turbine, I need some more space. That's my problem. What do we got? Let's have some space over here. This turbine, for example, you've got, you've got fluid coming in and fluid going out. Oh, <clears throat> let me change my color. I was, <laughs> my son was drawing on my surface last night. I was like, hey, there's this cool um, star thing. All right, and you can do that. And he was loving it. Um, whatever. And he screamed when I took it off him. And, what are you going to do? All right, cool. Sorry. So you've got fluid going through this turbine. Okay. One can imagine this turbine would be insulated, which is actually not a bad assumption in, in some senses. So the, the, the heat loss is far less than the power that you're getting through the unit. Right? But as the fluid travels through, it's going to hit the stator blades and the rotor blades. And if you want to see what stator blades and rotor blades look like, in a turbine, you can look at the device that's sectioned just as you walk into the lab, right? So you've got a, um, you've got a compressor and turbine <coughs> in that jet engine there. Okay, and as the air comes through, let's have blue for air, that'll work. Right? As the air comes through, it's gonna swirl and have slight areas of turbulence and unconstrained expansion and so forth. And so when the gas comes out, it's going to be hotter for the same pressure than it would be if it had travelled through in an ideal sense. So that's how you get this, this uncontrolled expansion, uh, friction, so friction past the wall, that sort of thing, is what makes a turbine not isentropic, even though you can insulate it quite well and have it approximate adiabatic. So yes, that's a good, that was a good pick up as well. Yeah, go. How do you define state 2s? Yes, so we can calculate state 2s actually. At the moment we can calculate state 2s easier than we can calculate state 2 actual. Because we've already done questions 
I'm trying, I'm trying to remember. I can't, I know. Sorry, I'm writing a couple of different quizzes. I'm writing your final exam. I'm like, have you already asked this? Have you already answered this question? I don't know. Don't take this as a, it's not necessarily a question anyway. But I think you've already answered um, a question saying like pressure, you know, a fluid enters a turbine at five megapascals in this pressure, exits at this pressure, isentropically, what's the, we're certainly not in class, in lectures, um, what's the work output, right? And so to do that, you've said, well, S equals, so if it's steam, you look up the table, you say S equals this at the beginning. I assume that S is the same. Is it superheated? Is it in the mixed region? If it's in the mixed region, I calculate quality, calculate enthalpy. If it's in the superheat, I interpolate on the superheat tables. Right, so you already know how to calculate H2S, right? Um, now I'm giving you a formula to calculate H2 actual based on a, a given efficiency. It's 90% efficient, it's 95% efficient. H2 actual is what you want to calculate. Um, it's not unusual. So the two things you might get is you might be given the turbine efficiency and required to calculate H2A, or you'll be given H2A and required to calculate the turbine efficiency. That would be normal things to, to look at. So you've taken some measurements on your turbine, how efficient is your turbine, where you can do this ca calculation, or you've been given a manufacturer specification that gives you your efficiency of turbine, what's the enthalpy of the fluid as it goes out, the quality maybe, um, as it goes out, where well, you can calculate H2A. So yeah, H2S, it has definition, I think we've already calculated it. We're certainly gonna do a calculation based on this um, today, this morning, right now. Good, I love it. No? Good. If you're not in the front little segment and you wanna ask a question, just say hey as you put up your hand. I'm just slightly short-sighted and might miss you. Um, otherwise, and I appreciate the interaction. So, before we do a calculation, let's flip it over and say, okay, now we're compressing a gas. Uh, that would be normal. So, you're compressing an ideal gas, for example. What we find is you have to put in more work into the compressor to compress between the same pressures than you ideally would have to. Okay? And so now, we say, well, what would be the ideal amount of work I would have to put in to compress the gas? And we divide that by the actual amount of work I have to put in. And this gives us a smaller number divided by a large number. It gives us an efficiency less than one again. So I'm just gonna go back to the turbine just so you can see the difference. So here we say actual on the top and uh, ideal on the bottom. For a compressor we say ideal on top and actual on the bottom. The great news is, well I don't, mm, I don't necessarily remember these, just like this is me. I don't necessarily remember these I calculate it, and if I get a number more than one, I flip it over. Because um, I'm real loose with my, my definitions. Um, so what does that look like? This is H2S minus H1, or divided by H2, whoop, A, right? That, that A is optional, depending on the notation of your textbook. Um, you'll find that these are the same thing. This is the same formula when you put a minus sign you know, times the top and the bottom by minus one, you flip the, the entropies over, en enthalpies over. Uh, and we will find that H2A will be greater than H2S. So you'll find that if you compress, um, if, you find you'll, if you compress a substance in a real compressor, you'll generate more heat than you would in an ideal case. And so H2 actual will be greater than H2. Again, yes, you're right, if there's heat loss, it won't, you'll have to take that into account. Um, and so you'll actually have to put more work in to compress things than you would like to ideally. Pictographically, we want to go from pressure one to pressure two. So we want to go in a straight line, vertical line on the TS diagram. In reality though, our real process kicks off to the right and our entropy increases as the process is undertaken. And you can imagine these processes being part of a cycle and I think we'll see some cycles as we go along. So, let's do a calculation and let's partially address your question of, pretty typical. Is this either a typical question for like a quiz one or two style quiz, or it's a typical part of a question for a final exam type um, thing. You might have a non-perfect uh, turbine or compressor and be required to calculate between them. So steam passes isentropically through a turbine, 
from a pressure and temperature to a pressure. What are the properties of state 2S and what is the turbine work? Uh, so we should do that. Have you got a feel for how you might start doing this kind of question? Have you just got a sense? Uh, let me come over to... So now we're talking ideal. So now we're saying the turbine is isentropic, okay? And then we're gonna introduce an efficiency, a turbine efficiency, and do the calculation. But I wanted to start in a place that I think you know. All right, draw a TS chart. Let's have a go. Cool. Let's do black. T, S. All right, TS chart. When you're dealing with a vapor, sorry, when you're dealing with a pure substance, you want to draw a vapor dome uh, on any charts that you do. For lab T4, you'll be expected in your final report to draw a pH chart, it's a pressure enthalpy chart, okay? If it doesn't include a vapor dome, it's really tough to see what the process is. So include a vapor dome in your final report for your lab when you address lab T4. That looks like a vapor dome for water. Um, in fact, it looks like a vapor dome for most substances. What's the highest this curve gets? Just out of interest. Does anyone know that temperature? We're doing well. No, no, no. It's fine, it's just something you might want to consider. So that's the critical temperature of water, so that's going to be 374. I'm going to say 375, because my drawing is rough enough. That's okay. And in terms of S, you're going to end up with a zero here and about a nine here. Uh, you know what, I've got a lecture prepared for it, how to draw these. We will see how we go today as to whether we do it. Um, and the S peaks at about four and a half. So that's our vapor dome located on our, on our thing. Now what have we got? We've got temperature of 650 and a pressure of nine. So the temperature is gonna be up here, for example. Oh, that looks like about a 650 kind of line. Now the question is, what is our entropy at that? I think we need to turn to our thermodynamic tables, property tables, and get a value for S in order to draw the TS chart. So, where do I have those? Do, do, do. Tables for reference. Well done, Phil. All right, looks like it's not saturated, looks like it's superheated. What was the pressure? Nine megapascals. Nine megapascals, temperature of 650. So we're looking here. So these are the values that we're going to use. Okay, we can see we've got an S just above seven. Um, actually, let's... Copy. Because I feel like we're going to refer to this a couple of times. Do, do, do. Awesome. It's not where I want it, that's okay. Go up there. All right. So, pressure of nine, temperature of 650. So this is the data we're going to use from our steam tables. So the S is gonna be 7.1. So it's going to start about there, okay? And we're gonna drop the pressure to 40 kilopascals. So we're gonna go, whoop, sound like this. And because I've already done this, I know it's gonna be in the mixed quality range. So it's gonna go down here. At 40 kilopascals of pressure, will the temperature be 
more than 100 degrees C or less than 100 degrees C? Just intuitively. Less, we agree, good. 76 degrees C. I looked it up earlier. Okay, so that's kind of what our state looks like. So we've got our state one, our state two, and we draw a vertical line with a downward facing arrow to indicate the state one and state two. Now, the other question is, what are the properties of state 2S and what's the turbine work? So now we want to know, so it's isentropic. Isentropic is our key. So S1 equals, I said 7.1, but let's write it out properly, 7.0943 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. So that's our S1. Our pressure one is nine megapascals. Our pressure two is 40 kilopascals. We'll jump over and grab the pressure table, saturated pressure. For reference, copy. During the quiz, I could have said this at the beginning, I didn't. So because you get to keep the paper, the bit that's blue or yellow, and because it's got reference tables at the back, uh, what I noticed people doing during quiz one last year that I don't think anyone did this year, is you can rip the tables off the back and place them side by side in as much as you have space to do so. And so for quick reference between them, if you felt like you were flipping back and forward a lot, feel free to tear those off. You get to keep the blue and yellow paper uh, when you go home. So with a known S value of 7.1-ish and a known pressure of 40 kilopascals, which I think is this one here, 76 degrees. Is the substance indeed a compressed liquid, a saturated mixture, or a superheated vapor? Mm -hmm. Turn to your neighbor and convince your neighbor of what you think it is. Is it a compressed liquid? Is it a saturated mixture? Or is it a superheated vapor? And how do you know that? I'm saying that given a known S2 equals S1 equals 7.09. I'm saying you can determine that based on this, and it's something people struggle with. So have a minute. Good question. Okay, and back to me. Do you agree? Do you feel confident with your answer? What is the answer? Saturated mixture? Does everyone agree with that? To me, to me, I think if it was a liquid at that pressure, it would have an entropy of about one. If it was fully vapor, it would have an entropy of 7.7, .7, okay? And so it's somewhere between liquid and vapor. So some of it's liquid, some of it's vapor. And so I think it's in the saturated mixture range. If the entropy was seven point, I would say entropy was eight flush, I know that eight is bigger than 7.7, .7, and so it must be a superheated vapor at that pressure. Okay, so that's how I convince myself of that in my own mind. Um, Hopefully that feels com comfortable and confident for you. Great question. Um, where do whoop, these numbers come from? I, just, I got a question which is good. So where's 375 come from? And where's 76 come from? And indeed, where does 0 and 9 come from? And 4 and a half. So that's probably things I should just talk to for a moment. Um, you'll notice that. So 375, I propose that 375 is the temperature of the critical point. So above that temperature, you can only have superheated, uh, superheated uh, 
gas vapor, right? And where I get that from is this is your properties of saturated liquid water, okay? It comes from a very low pressure and very low temperature up to a very high pressure and a very high temperature. And lo and behold, it only comes to that temperature, okay? So that's the highest temperature at which you can get a saturated mixture. And therefore, that is this peak temperature here, okay? That's the highest point of the peak. Uh, where do I get my 76 degrees from? Like I said, I, I did this problem before I came, right? At um, 40 kilopascals of pressure at a saturated mixture, I knew it was a saturated mixture, okay? The temperature is indeed nominally 76. Okay, just for tidiness, I didn't write 75 and a half, 75.9. Um, oops. So that's where I got that temperature from, okay? What about these ones here? This zero over here and this nine over here. So I get that from at the lowest temperature, okay? So at the very low temperature, <clears throat> you've got a very wide span of possible entropies, okay? So I come to my very lowest temperature on my saturated chart, very lowest pressure, very lowest temperature, and I find that the, if it was a saturated fluid, it would be zero, and if it was a saturated vapor, it would be a little sh a shy more than nine, okay? So that gives me my tails at the left and right hand side, gives me that point there and that point there. Yeah, they tend towards 9.15 and zero. Oops, I'm deleting things that I need like the axis. Can't be a chart without an axis. Where does the four and a half come from? At my very peak temperature, I say, well, what is the, um, what's the entropy at the very peak? And this one's kind of interesting. If it was a saturated liquid, it would be 4.43. If it was a saturated gas, it would be 4.43. Okay, so that's the point at which the two lines touch and there's no difference between the S of a saturated gas and the S of a saturated vapor. Sorry, liquid and vapor, respectively, for your, for your benefit. So we know that this line peaks at 4.4, and I'm just a bit sloppy with my numbers, so I said 4.5. So it's got the general form of a, gap, a graph you could use. Yes? Oh. Uh, it doesn't tend to go to a zero. The question was about what I've done here. If I delete that, would it? Oh, no. No, so it doesn't. Oh, that's a worse curve than I had before. Um, it doesn't tend towards zero. It does tend towards 0 0.01. That's a worse curve again. Um, in terms of temperature, it, it tends towards this number, 0 0.01 which is the triple point temperature of pure water. So it doesn't tend towards zero degrees C, it tends towards 0 0.01 degrees C um, for reasons I, I think I've explained earlier. Uh, da, 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 da. If you have to draw a freehand TS chart for water, oh wait, there's one more thing I should do, which is if I was worried, and I'm, partic I'm not particularly, but if I was worried about the shape of this curve, Okay, what I could do is I could go to a series of known temperatures or pressures, because I'll, I'll pull the pressure chart in, but that's okay. Like 100 degrees C, 120 degrees C, 140 degrees C, 180 degrees C, whatever. And I could work out for 100 degrees C what the S of the fluid state is and the S of the vapor state. And I could draw those as little X's on my chart. And then I could draw a line joining my little X's. So to show you that, here, for example, um, I could come to 100 degrees C, which is about here, about one bar. That looks about right, 100 degrees C. And I could say, give me an X at 1.3, 100, and give me an X at 7.4, 100, okay? And then come up to 200 degrees C and say, give me an X at 2.3, 200 and give me an exit 6.4, 200, okay? So you can redevelop a TS chart in detail from your 
tables, they represent the same information differently, graphically or in a tabulated form. Um, how's everyone doing with the TS chart? Same thing for pH. You, could, you can develop a pH chart from a table with just a little bit of diligence and nous. And I suggest that you'll want to for the refrigerant used in lab T4. Everyone doing okay? Good. No response is good. Good response. Um, great questions though. I appreciate that because it let me clarify some stuff. So now, we're, in an isentropic manner, we're reducing the pressure of steam from 9 megapascals to 40 kilopascals. So S1 equals um, 7.1. S2 equals S1 because it's isentropic equals 7.0943 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. So now what's the state? We're asked, what are the properties of state 2S and what's the turbine work, the ideal turbine work? So it's a saturated mixture. We've just established that. So it's going to have an X, it's going to have a quality value. And our quality is going to be our S2, I'm going to call it S2S, S2S, our ideal S2 minus S of the fluid state divided by S of the fluid gas, which equals 7.0943 minus S of the fluid state was 1.0260. 1.0260. Cool. Divided by 6.6449. 6.6449. Quality equals. X2S. Sorry, I didn't plug it into a calculator. I did I plug it into a calculator earlier. Um, so we do indeed find a saturated mixture, and according to my chart, okay, we would find that the length of this line divided by the length of that line would be 0 0.91. So 90, 91% quality. Cool. Uh, we need a H2S. So the other thing we need is power, the work from the turbine. Uh, the formula of work from a turbine. So it'll be work turbine S. Any thoughts on the formula for work from a, that we get from a turbine? In this form? Difference in enthalpies. So it'll be H1 because H1 is bigger. Oops minus H2S equals what's H1, come back up here, 3755.3, 3755.3 minus H2S, which will be 0 0.9132 times the difference in H's at that given pressure, which is this value here, 2319.1, 2319.1 plus this value here, which is 317.6. Yeah, so I've just defined my H2S value in terms of interpolating on quality. And I'll have to go over here. I plugged in the calculator earlier. And the work equals 1319.8 kilojoules per kilogram. Excellent. So that's the ideal work. That's the most work we can possibly get out of a turbine if we give it, um, if we give it steam at 650 degrees C and 9 megapascals 
and we extract the steam at 40 kilopascals, which is very low. That's, so we're talking about low atmospheric pressure. We should talk in the Rankine cycle how we, how we achieve that. Um, then we can get this much energy per kilogram of fluid that we push through that turbine. That would be our isentropic, our ideal, our best case state. Okay? And question B must then be, because we're talking about isentropic efficiency, steam passes from the same state through the adiabatic turbine, so adiabatic, so Q equals zero, to a state of 40 kilopascals, so the pressure's the same, but now we're saying, just imagine that it leaves in the saturated vapor state, so not at 91% quality, but 100% quality. You think being 100% quality is better than being at 91% quality, but our turbine wants to take all the energy it can out of the, out of the fluid. So now the turbine hasn't taken as much energy as it, as it did ideally, okay? Uh, we'll just we'll go to the second part later. Calculate the isentropic efficiency of the turbine is what I want to do, P point two. And then the other thing is, if we run it through a pipe and it cools down, what happens with entropy? We're talking about isentropic, so we're talking about an, an, uh, an entropic process. So I just want to track entropy as well. Uh, when we come back to this question. So let's take a break. Let's come back to this at 11.05, according to this number here. Have a think about that while you stretch and everything else. Cool. Come back in six minutes. Good. Excellent. All right, guys, it's 11.05. Let's re-kick off with our isentropic efficiency. Would you believe I was stressing out, thinking, I don't have enough content. What am I going to teach for two hours? Um, and, you know, here it is. An hour's gone past. We haven't even covered a single topic. So we'll, uh, we'll try and get to the ranking cycle. A uh, couple of great questions during the break. I appreciate having a break because it gives the opportunity for people who... Sh Look, I would appreciate if you put your hand up and said, hey, you got something wrong. Or how'd you get this or whatever? Um, but I also appreciate it when you come and talk personally, so that's, that's fine too. Uh, a couple of things that I, I should have said that I didn't. One thing I should, I should have said that I didn't, and one thing that I just wrote the, uh, the analysis out wrong. Uh, one question was, why is this a 2S and not just a 2? So we're passing from state 1 to state 2, ostensibly, why have I written 2S? This is a really unusually phrased question, and it's related to the fact that I'm just teaching the topic for the first time, so oh, it's kind of a bit tough. But So this is our isentropic case. What I wanted to do was ask the isentropic case and then ask the real case. And so for the isentropic case, steam passes isentropically, I had the steam pass from state point one to state point two S. Okay, so that was our isentropic turbine. Now for the question we're just about to go to, which is question B, now steam's passing through an adiabatic turbine that's not isentropic. Now it's going to start pass from state point one to state point two. Okay, so I didn't make that clear. In your actual question, what you would actually get is you'd get a state point one and a state point two, and you would have to kind of create a state point two S for your own analysis purpose. What I did was I split that up. So I, I said, well, let's do that first, because you would have to do it first and let's do the, um, the efficiency afterwards. So I, I hope I didn't confuse anyone with that little fabrication um, of a construct there. The other question was, um, someone diligently, well done, uh, typed this equation into their calculator and didn't get a value of around 1300, they got a value of around 2000. In my haste to write it out and let you go on a break, I had neglected to put these brackets that I've now drawn in green. So what's, what's bracketed in green is the definition of H2S. And of course, we wanted H1 minus H2S. But if you didn't put the brackets in, as I, as I didn't, uh, this ends up being a plus, And you'll get a number that's about, what, 630. Incorrect. So 630 more than what you should have gotten. Um, that's just my lazy shorthand. I should have calculated H2S and then subtracted the numbers. But that's the answer nevertheless. So that was, uh, that was questions that came during the break. I appreciate it. Thank you for picking me up on my uh, lazy 
notation. Cool. So, to finish off isentropic efficiency then, um, let's just answer this series of questions. So now we've got a similar sort of process, but it's going to now not X2S, but X2 um, of one, so it's a saturated vapor. Our process now, just on our TS chart, our process doesn't look like a vertical line anymore. It looks like a line that curves off to the right. And indeed touches at 40 megapascals, but at the saturated vapor state. So we would label this point, oh, I need more colors, star color, no. Um, let's label this point here, that would be state two, and we'll label this point here, state two S. Other way around. So the ideal process is a saturated mixture, the real process is a saturated vapor. Excellent. Draw the process on a TS chart, tick, as above. Calculate the isentropic efficiency of the turbine. All right. So we had defined isentropic efficiency, turbine isentropic efficiency, as being the difference in H's actual divided by the difference in H's in isentropic sense. Yeah, so you get less power out than you want to, and so that'll give you a ratio that's less than one. Literally, I do that every time, I just check. So we know that we've got a H1, and we've got a H2, oops, H2 actual, and we've got a H1, and we've got a H2 isentropic. And we know the number at the bottom is 13, 19.8. Excellent. H1 we know is 3755.3. What's H2 actual? Well, we're given two independent intrinsic values, so which we can calculate it using. We're given a pressure of 40 kilopascals and a quality of one. Just so you know, like I did this for you, right? So it would be easy. Um, so at 40 kilopascals and a quality of one, we should have a H2 actual of, oops, 2319.1. 2319.1. So that was just from table. And that should be Oops, I'm wrong. Whoop. That is HFG. Should be 2636.7. Sorry, because I want HG. 2636.7. Um, I... I advise bringing a ruler to the exam. And again, the paper is yours. So like, I physically draw a line on the sheet of paper when I'm looking up tables. Not in my textbook, because I don't draw lines in my textbook. But when it's printed out for me, I physically draw lines. All right, and what's that equal to? I don't know if I've got it written down. 11, 12. Excellent, good. 84.75%. Okay, so the isentropic efficiency or the efficiency of this turbine is around 85%. And so you get, we well should get a kilowatt of uh, power out of it, you get 850 watts of power out of it. Um, you want an isentropic efficiency in the 90 to 95 range. So this is not a great turbine. Um, in those terms. So we have calculated the isentropic efficiency of the turbine. Everyone happy with the application of that formula? The implications, what it means? Good. If the efficiency of the turbine was higher, 
we would have a saturated mixture. Because the other thing I could have said is, you know, it's a 95% efficient turbine, what's the H2 actual? What's the actual work of the turbine and so forth? Um, all right, so it would be a saturated mixture. If it was a less efficient turbine, it would be a superheated vapor. Calculate the entropy generated for each process. So it's not isentropic, so we should have entropy generated. So how are we doing that? Uh, so let's have a look at that. Our entropy generation equation back from, so this is our entropy ba balance equation, is the ds for the system on dt equals sum of mass in entropy in minus sum of mass exit entropy exit plus across each of the thermal transition boundaries Q at that boundary divided by the temperature at that boundary plus entropy generation sigma. Now, this term on the left, so this is change in entropy within the system over time, okay? We've got a steady state, steady flow system, so our change in entropy in the system over time should be zero. We've got a system with only one mass flow, so this will be mass flow S in minus S exit, plus now we've got two processes here, I didn't kind of introduce them, but one's our turbine from state one to state two, and our other one is we're gonna reduce the temperature of the, of the substance back to X3, so X3 is gonna be X2S. So the question is, we can get to the same state, the same fluid state, but in one way, all the heat's drawn out in the turbine, in the other way, some of the heat's drawn out in the turbine as, as work, and then some is lost as heat loss in the subsequent piece of pipe work. So what's the, the uh, entropy generated as part of the two processes? So we, we are going to have a Q on T for one of the processes, so we need to include that, and we're going to have an entropy generation term as well. So for the first process, so for the adiabatic turbine, we'll have none of, no heat generation, uh, no heat transfer across the boundary. So it will just be entropy generated is S exit minus S in, which is the S of the exit is the S at a quality of one. So that's 7.6709. 7.6709. 7.6709. And the entry in was 7.09.43. Uh, it's not specified in the question. Yeah. So I didn't I didn't include mass flow because this is just a turbine, you don't know how much mass is flowing through it. It's a good question. Kilojoules per kilogram. Kelvin. So that's the entropy generated through the turbine. And in this case, because the process is adiabatic, the entropy generated is just the difference in the entropies in the two fluid flows. You say, where does the entropy come from? The entropy is generated as you have uncontrolled expansion and inefficiencies, friction and so forth throughout the turbine. So this would be entropy generated from one to two. And then we'll take the same equation, take this equation down here, and look at a pipe flow, where as the fluid flows through the pipe, it loses quality back to 91%, okay? And so it's steady state, steady flow again, so there's no change in the entropy over time, okay? And again, we've got mass flow, entropy in minus entropy out, plus, the heat lost in the pipe divided by the temperature of the boundary, or the temperature which the heat is lost, plus entropy generated. We're given a boundary temperature. So we're given 
the temperature of the cold reservoir boundary is 60 degrees C. So we know our entropy in now for state. So we say state 2 to 3. We know our entropy in was 7.6709. We know the entropy of the exit was, interestingly, 7.0943, just because of the way I constructed the, the problem. Yes. How come the quality's gone up from the exit of the turbine to the exit of the reservoir? Yep, sorry, so the quality here, x equals 1, and the quality here, x equals, well, if I'm going to use that, let's go 0 0.9132. So the quality is going down as you have heat flow, Q, leaving from the pipe into the cold reservoir. It's a good question. Thank you. Um, I'm just kind of flipping back and forth between my calculations and the problem specification, assuming that you have read and understood the problem specification, but it's the first time you've seen it. So um, that's probably unfair. Thank you for asking the question. So that's our mass flow. Our heat must be our H3 minus our H2. So the heat here, so Q23, must equal, or it's going to be lowercase in this case, Q23 is going to be H3 minus H2. H2 minus H3. It's going to come in at a higher energy and leave at a lower energy. Nope. Sorry, 3 minus 2. Because it must be negative because heat's leaving the system. So then this is H3 minus H2 divided by 60 plus 273. So we convert our temperature, our boundary temperature to Kelvin. Oops, sorry, and we've transferred that to the other side, in which case this must be a negative. And that has to be a negative. Sorry, that's really bad. All right. I feel like I'm being really loose with my hand calcs, which might be confusing. Is everyone okay? H3 should be... So H3 should be what H2A was, because that's our definition of what we're doing. We're take, going back to the same, um, or H2S. So that there is equal to our H3, and our H2 is given elsewhere. I'm going to throw this up as PowerPoint slides and I'll upload it because it's taking a long time and I'm going back and forth, which I think is confusing. So I'm going to show the calculations of that in the uploaded PowerPoint slides on Moodle rather than keep mucking around with hand calcs. And I apologize that I've just stumbled through that for the last 10 minutes. So what I was trying to show was something about entropy generation, but I feel like I've lost a little bit about the conversation about isentropic efficiency. But isentropic efficiency is something that you want to be able to calculate.